Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Ken Yusko, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Charles Sherbaum and Harold Goldstein. Uh, couldn't be here today. He's actually at the NFL Combine uh, assessing the players. Uh, these are really exciting times for the NFL. Definitely challenging, but really exciting. International participation, deeper ties to the communities through NFL West and the stadium initiative. Um, initiatives like Play 60, which gets children involved in exercise uh, and uh, health and uh, safety, of course. One of my uh, favorite of these initiatives began about five years ago when the NFL really focused on elevating the game. I know that's the tagline for the conference, but uh, it was in, in print five years ago. And the, the thought was, let's elevate the game through talent and, and developing player talent specifically. And from the league perspective, the idea was, let's enhance the fan experience. Let's electrify the fan base. Let's give people something really to be excited about. From the team perspective, they thought of uh, talent development as one way to uh, leverage talent for competitive advantage. And so the idea was, how can you do this? Obviously, you can train better. You can use metrics. There's a whole lot of ways. Our focus was on uh, assessment and, and I, uh, assessing and um, evaluating the talent, on, certainly not on the physical football side, but on more on the psychological side. There was a, a person named Cyrus Merry, who is the co-founder of the Fritz Pollard Alliance. I don't, I don't know if you know that group in the NFL. It's the Rooney Rule group. And Cyrus is uh, really kind of a, a systems HR change person. And his thinking was, let's take the best practices in private and public sector in terms of assessment and evaluation, and let's import them to sports. And so that, that was the model. Of course, um, if you're going to do that, you better make sure your practices are, are relevant and appropriate for the NFL environment, which is this ultra-competitive, hyper-physical, everything's uh, spotlight on everybody kind of environment. Uh, so we went into the NFL uh, about five years ago and d created a study to see if we could identify um, a competency model that, that would help us understand talent evaluation better. The current, or the model at that time, focused a lot on past performance. Uh, certainly looked at scouting and film and metrics, uh, coach interviews, player interviews, background checks, a uh, ton of data. They also had standardized data, right? We looked at uh, the NFL Combine, uh, Pro Days, the Wonderlick would be an example of a psychological uh, standardized data approach. And we did a pretty good job, except the idea was maybe you could do better. Anybody who remembers Tom Brady going at 199 in the sixth round of the 2000 uh, draft? I know there's a lot of football fans in this uh, audience who would debate everything, but I would argue maybe Brady should have gone in the late fifth round instead of the late sixth round. So could we do better by adding something to the mix? Uh, the whole focus of the conference so far is on metrics and on data analytics and using the data that are out there better. And, and Billy Bean in his panel yesterday said, you know, people are catching up. They're learning how to do it. Uh, the incremental returns from that are kind of shrinking. This approach was to add data to the pool and so to expand the data that were available then to try and use in a competitive uh, sense. What we focused on as a potential approach was the idea of standardized psychological tests. The model, as I had mentioned, was heavy on past performance. It certainly dominated uh, the physical uh, kind of assessment in terms of all the on-field and film uh, approaches, but there was a heavy focus also on psychological variables, learning and intelligence. They weren't standardized. Still, we talk about interviewing coaches, interviewing players, and that's totally appropriate. But the flip side is, to match the physical approach to standardized data that we see in the combine on pro days, agility, strength, speed testing, maybe we could add 
league-wide standardized psychological assessment. What we had so far were some tests that measured general intelligence, kind of struggled to show that they worked in a football environment. So the thinking was, maybe we could develop these competencies that were football related. Maybe the ability to learn plays. Anybody who's ever sat in an install class when you cover 30 plays in 30 minutes can understand how hard it is to understand this stuff. If you've ever been on the sidelines during a football game, you know how fast the game moves and how quickly you have to think. So the idea was to identify these competencies that were very football related, yet had a basis outside of sports where we could leverage our understanding of how to measure them. And so our goal and our target was around these potential psychological variables to add to the database. Five years ago, we had a study led by oh, people like John Elway, uh, Tom Dimitrov, who was at this conference last year, GM of the Atlanta Falcons, Ernie Accorsi, legendary GM for the Giants and Browns and Colts, and a whole bunch of other people, kind of lead an effort to really understand what made a great player. And what emerged was a set of 16 factors, all of these drivers and motives, learning preferences. And, and two key areas did emerge. The idea of intelligence and personality adding to the mix. This is NFL football. We understand that these aren't the primary drivers necessarily. Absolutely could be important, but the game is so physical. And, and so dominated by uh, uh, physical attributes that this was looked at as a potential uh, incremental extra to that mix, not as a substitute, okay? And so we looked at intelligence, and as I said, we looked at ability to learn, ability to think quickly, uh, uh, avoid mental errors, uh, all of the factors that we could uh, reasonably tie to performance on the field. On the personality side, we looked at leadership, teamwork, uh, self-control, dependability, preparedness, uh, team fit. So we thought, okay, here are some really core predictive components, and we ended up building uh, an assessment out of that, building items that tied to these particular dimensions. So we had a bunch of subscales, and what emerged was a one-hour test that's uh, given at the Combine um, every year uh, since 2013, 100% participation. So we have every player who goes through the Combine has data on, on these measures. And, and so the teams can get uh, really good data, hopefully, to help them uh, evaluate the talent in the draft, but also to develop people. Because once the teams get the players, they, they start a task, now what? So we modified some of the information we had collected into more of a coaching report. And there's a, a lot to that. Um, one example is we measure confidence, we measure ability to make decisions. It is one thing for a player to be super confident and not make such great decisions versus a player who makes spectacular decisions and is, very, uh, is not at all confident, right? So you'd handle those players differently. In terms of motives and drivers, you might work with players differently. So we also, in addition to doing this assessment piece, uh, we added on maybe a year into the process a heavy uh, assess, uh, development component. And, and the question, of course, the big question is, does it work? And if it doesn't work, you can't use it. And, and our background, we're industrial organizational psychologists. Heavy litigation, employment discrimination kind of work. The standard is you have to demonstrate that what you're measuring actually is connected to some meaningful outcome. I think we heard that on the stage in the last presentation. And so we began a three-year validation study. Uh, we collected 1,500 uh, player scores from the combine. If you know that about 330 people come to the Combine each year, the math is a little off. That's because up until recently, there was the Super Regional, right? So that provided a whole bunch of extra players uh, for the database. And then each team, hard to believe, but each team provided extremely in-depth ratings on each of the players in the study. Um, not, not everybody in, in the Combine sample, of course, because not everybody gets, lands on a team. But we got about 70% participation across each year, across all 32 teams, which is it's quite remarkable when you think about how people uh, leave and cycle through at the end of the season. 
So we ended up with coaches' ratings after they had seen the players in action for at least a year on about 24 dimensions. And then the question, of course, was could the initial assessment that was taken before they had seen any time with the team indicate or predict what the coaches would say? And that's a classic validation study. We also gathered uh, some uh, on-field metrics, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. The bottom line is, when we looked at about 500 players who we ended up getting performance data on, we got really nice correlations. If there are any physics, uh, physicists in the audience, they're probably saying, well, a 0.28 is kind of low. Uh, that's true in physical sciences. In behavioral sciences, a 0.28 correlation it is pretty good. Of course, these correlations uh, are also uncorrected. They're extremely conservative. We didn't do any data uh, uh, enhancement on them. And so, and, and again, this is uh, a measure intended to be used in addition to all of the physical uh, kinds of measures and skills measures. So we were able to actually predict which players the coaches said would learn the game readily. Anybody who sees players making a mistake because they don't know the plays knows how important that is. Do they really understand the game and how it works? Do they avoid mental errors? Do they make good decisions under stress? So the cognitive ability assessment part did a really nice job as a composite it correlated about 0.30 with the coaches' ratings of those kinds of behaviors. We saw a similar pattern for personality. You got about mid twos on a lot of the correlations, and the composite, again, was uh, about a 0.29. So we were able to predict uh, facets of behavior that included passion for the game, work ethic, how resilient you were, how you managed stress, did you play as well as a team player, did you take a leadership position, did you adapt to information week over week, right, which is critical to development, and did you improve over time. So in the eyes of the coaches, we had a, uh, an assessment device that could give them an early indicator, obviously not perfect, no test is a crystal ball, but we gave them an early indicator of what they could expect a year out, two years out, even three years out now. Not everybody really likes correlations. Um, not everybody really understands how to interpret them. So just to give you a perspective about what those correlations look like from a decision-making uh, standpoint, I'll just give you an example. Um, we broke the uh, distribution of test scores into high, medium, and low. That uh, high and low component each uh, include about 25% of the sample. And then the coaches' ratings, high, medium, and low, actually corresponded to their scale scores. So low performers were considered uh, by the coaches to be poor or marginal. High performers were considered to be excellent or outstanding. Middle performers, medium performers were considered to be acceptable, good, very good. So we had about seven scale points. We had really nice um, uh, variation across the categories, distribution across the categories. We, we were surprised that the coaches were pretty, pretty straightforward in, in who they evaluated and, and what they said. And so the results indicated when you look at a low test score, so these are people who did uh, poorly on intelligence on the uh, PAT. The folks who scored low were about three times more likely to be evaluated as poor performers or disappointments than stars by the coaches, okay? Also, the high performers on the test, in terms of intelligence, were about three times more likely to be seen as stars by the coaches than disappointments. If you put the two together, when you think about making a, a cut score, or who's going to make the team, when you look at high performers, if you're a high performer on the test, you're only seen as a low performer by the coach 13% of the time. So 87% of the time, you're seen as either good to great. And the misses, false positives and negatives, are pretty low, right? That's when the test says you are low, but you turn out to be evaluated high by the coaches and vice versa. The same pattern happened with personality. A little bit stronger, if you scored low on the test on the personality side, for those personality variables that I described, coaches were about four times as likely to describe you as a low uh, performer than a high performer. 
and that same pattern happened on the high side. If you were seen as being a high performer on the test, the coaches would see you as a high performer on the field uh, about four and a half times as often, okay? For people who scored strongly on the personality component, 91% of them were seen as either good to great by the coaches. Okay, so we get some pretty good, th these, and I know you're gonna tell me, well, let's look at the middle, um, I, I, absolutely. But, but this is just intended to show you that the way coaches use the underlying data, meaning identifying the top players and the bottom players, uh, we, we get some pretty good correspondence with on-field behavior. And we also looked at combining intelligence and personality, right? Because that's two, I talked about them as two distinct dimensions. Um, when you look at it predicting overall coaches' ratings, because they rated people overall, we get a pretty decent correspondence. We get a little incremental bump up uh, to about 0.35. The really interesting thing is when we look at the dimension scores of personality and intelligence and combine them, we can predict things that the coaches rate that you couldn't do as well from either. So when you look at managing stress, for example, really important for coaches, how well you make decisions when under stress, the whole game you're pretty much under stress. When you combine the ability level on intelligence and the personality uh, variable stress tolerance, you can actually get a 0.22 correlation on how coaches rate you in terms of making good decisions under stress. That's inter it's interesting to us because if you're very calm and cool and you make lousy decisions, that, that doesn't really help, right? So the interesting question is, do you make good decisions? And then when you're under stress, do you continue to make good decisions versus falling apart? As we started to move off the coaches' ratings to more on-field metrics, we again saw decisions under stress actually correlating with penalties, right? So we standardize across position and, and, and all of that. Um, you certainly see better results for the D-backs, for example, uh, than, than looking across the positions. But looking across all the positions, we get you know, a pretty nice correlation with both number of penalties per play committed and also yards per penalty. And the first study we did was just a little look with an initial database. Um, I think Jack Rizzi is in the audience. He helped us with a lot of that data. Um, and then the next study involved a little bit larger sample. And that was about 400 and so or so people. And, and the results held. So what we're seeing here is that personality variables actually uh, do uh, predict uh, the on-field metrics, which was really interesting to us uh, because we, we wanted to get beyond the, just the coaches' ratings, as important as that is. Same thing happened with injuries. I thought this was really interesting because injuries are so bumpy. Right? It's hard to predict injuries. Things happen that are beyond the player's control. So we have a fairly small correlation there, but it is significant. Certainly, I would argue it's meaningful. Right? A, a series of little bits of uh, help across the different criteria using the test is what you want to do. Right? So you, you look at enough criteria, you look at enough indicators, and you get a decent picture of the person. Billy Bean's panel again yesterday talked about really understanding the person was the way uh, to, to make good predictions. So the injury piece is fascinating. It's an early study. We haven't looked at the type of injury yet, um, so we're, we're looking forward to doing that. But we're starting to move off of um, on-field, uh, I'm sorry, coaches' ratings and uh, metrics, uh, on-field metrics to position-related metrics, which is the really interesting thing, like sacks and yak and, and tackles for a loss and that kind of thing. Uh, and that's coming up next. It's a little harder to do it at this point because you need a really strong sample across the positions in order to do a lot of these calculations. But that's one of the advantages to the league-wide approach where you're getting data on everybody who's involved and you can start getting decent sample sizes across the positions. So going forward, that's what we're looking at now. Uh, in addition to giving uh, the coaches kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down guidance uh, and, and having them integrate the data, uh, helping them integrate the data as a whole. Okay, so right now we'll turn it over to Charles who'll talk a little bit about uh, additional, uh, more uh, in-depth analyti uh, analytics and uh, future directions.
my mic turned on. Um, at this point, we have some pretty compelling evidence to say that these assessments in and of themselves are related to how coaches see the players, and ultimately that's the bottom line that matters, because if the coaches see them as poor, they're not likely to play. And so we wanted to share just two additional directions that we're working on right now, as we thought this is a sports analytics conference. It might be pretty interesting to all of you. The first thing we're doing is that we've looked at a lot of these psychological characteristics, really in isolation. You know, we've done some small combinations, but we really haven't looked at the multivariate profile across these to say, are essentially there are different types of players who have different constellations of these characteristics, and how is that related to essentially derailment or risk factors? When you think about these are pretty critical decisions that uh, coaches and GMs and teams need to make during the draft and player selection, free agency. So can we identify players that are likely to derail? because that's something that's risk, and we think about risk, you might avoid that person, or you might want to price that risk in if we think about it from a, a risk management idea like you would have in insurance. And the other thing we're really interested in is looking at what happens over long periods of time. Um, particularly, we start thinking about second contracts in the NFL. For many people, particularly those that come in second, third, fourth round, the first contract isn't, uh, isn't particularly large. So you look at a player like, uh, say, a Russell Wilson, who very early in his career won a Super Bowl and was essentially his salary compared to others was quite low. Um, from a team's perspective, those are the types of players you want to find, the undervalued. So how can we look at what will happen to a player over time? And so we thought we'd share just two examples uh, of what we're doing and share you a little bit about that. And one of the first things we're doing right now is developing player profiles. And what it is we want to see is if you think about market research, right, they will, uh, Amazon, Macy's, uh, Target, you name it, will profile their customers on their shopping behavior, on their responses to their uh, customer satisfaction surveys to see if they can find a particular type of customer, like say an urban hipster, right? And once they have that information based on your behavior and the attitudes, they can differentially market to you. So if you're somebody who wants the latest and greatest, they're going to make sure that everything they email and mail to you contains the latest and greatest. Likewise, if you are a parent of young children and you have certain profile characteristics, they're going to market to you very differently. So we're using a lot of those techniques, cluster analysis, mixture models, to try to identify are there essentially different categories of players that have different constellations of these physical and psychological characteristics. And just to give you an example of what that might look like, um, what we here have here on the screen is uh, you know, just something that we pulled together off some of the data that says, if we were to look at data from 2014, 15, and 16, we could essentially find nine different profiles of players in the NFL using data that's physical, and the physical data comes from the coaches, where the coaches said the player was you know, very physical, talented player versus that they were uh, not necessarily among the top of the league on that, as well as some of the psychological characteristics. So if we were to look at something in the column that says seven there, we can see that's a cluster of players that has, it's above average, these are Z scores, so they're standardized scores. They're above average on physical, so these are some of the more physically talented players. They're smart, and they've got the right mix of personality. They're leaders, they're dependable, they're prepared, they're good teammates. Really, these are the people that have the whole package. We can look at other constellations, for example, in example group nine. They have all the psychological characteristics, they're above average, they're quite good at those things, but physically, not quite as talented as other players. Likewise, if we look at um, cluster three, these people are physically talented. These are among some of the more talented players physically, yet psychologically, you know, they're not good teammates, they're not leaders, they're not prepared, they're not dependable. So you can think they've got the physical goods, but they struggle to learn, and they're not good teammates. They have a lot of things that might be undesirable in a player. And so not only can we look at this, then we can start tagging uh, risk factors as well as success factors to these. Um, and just for an example, since we know everybody here loves metrics and sports data, is we looked at uh, pro football references uh, approximate value, which is a metric that they created to try to standardize across players to look at their value of them. Um, is this a good player? And the distribution of this is fairly skewed, but many people have argued if you have a score of four, or below on the approximate value. So if you're four or less on this metric, you're kind of seen as a bust in the NFL. You're not seen as very successful. And really about half the players would fall into that uh, category when we think about people coming out of the draft. So if we were to look at, say, a group like number seven, 41% of the people in that cluster, the people that have the whole package, only 41% percent of them are seen as busts. So in general, if you think about the opposite, 60% of these people are successful. Um, whereas if you look at, say, number six, which really is low on everything, about 83% of those people are uh, 
seen as unsuccessful. If you look at the line above it, which is a score of six or above, those are generally seen as successful players, zero percent. This is a very high risk group. So if you had a player that had that type of profile, it's unlikely if you were to draft them that they're going to be successful in the NFL. So although, you know, they don't really have anything. Whereas if you look at number seven, which has the whole package, most of those people tend to be successful. So that's a very low risk decision for a player that has that type of physical and psychological makeup. But what's interesting is we start looking at there's a lot of ways of success. So we think about there's a lot of ways to be a good manager. There's a lot of ways to be a successful football player. And if we were to compare group three compared to group nine, they're almost the mere opposites. One has the physical makeup to be successful, but doesn't really have the psychological makeup. Whereas group nine doesn't really have as much of the physical makeup, but has all the psychological characteristics. And when we look at the failure rate, they're the same. So if we were to really think about what's valued, much like Moneyball was about trying to find undervalued players, approaches like this can help find undervalued players in the draft. So people that may not be the most physical players, yet they're smart, they're a good teammate, they're dependable, they're prepared, they're a leader, they find ways to succeed in the NFL roughly at the same rates as people who might be you know, the big star who goes in the first round. So some of these can lead to some unique insights about who can be successful. And this is just one of our initiatives right now, saying how do we put this all together to really find value in ways of de-risking some very critical decisions that teams are going to make, particularly when we move off you know, the first round stars that are beyond physically gifted, right? These are the Greek gods. What happens when we move to the second, third, fourth, and fifth round? How can we find those Tom Brady's? Now, most of our work to date has looked only at really short time periods. The rookie year has looked at maybe a year or two in the league. What we're really interested in is what happens long term. Some people might start off very slow in the league, but then hit their stride and accelerate quite rapidly and become a star. Other people might start hot, have an amazing rookie season, and then from there on out, decrease over time. So what we're really focused on right now is how to do some longitudinal modeling to look at who's likely to be a success. And for us, where the real interest in is beyond that second contract. So if I'm evaluating a player who in the first three years I have their data, what kind of predictions can I make about their success after I sign them to the second contract, which usually is the big money for a lot of players. So is that a good decision to go all in on a player and give them a very generous, rich contract, or are they likely to fade out pretty quickly in the NFL after we sign that contract? So a lot of our work right now is to try to look at these models to identify who's going to ramp up over time, who might stay consistently good, consistently average, and who might decline over time. Um, and obviously from a pricing decision, we think about contracts. This has a lot of value for the teams. And again, combined with the other information that they're looking at, can help them take some of the risk out of a number of these decisions, which we know are inherently risky for the teams. And so just to kind of wrap up our talk a little bit here, you know, really what we have focused on is that there's an opportunity to expand the data space. I mean, we saw a great presentation right before this that talked about a lot of metrics and a lot of ways they are expanding the space through video and tracking and a lot of things that essentially are just byproducts of natural activity in practice and on the field performance. What really has been missing to date on a systematic league-wide level is the psychological piece in a way that's standardized, that's efficient. Players can do this in one hour. I mean, everybody this morning, uh, what, almost 100 players sat down for one hour and took these assessments at the NFL Combine. So it gives us an efficient, systemized way to get insights about players that can really help identify who is the hidden gems, who's likely to be very successful in the league, as well as who's likely to be unsuccessful in the league. Um, and this is really an undertapped, utilized resource that at least professional football, because everybody's looking at this stuff just in a very unsystematic way. Um, so with that, we'll kind of wrap up our presentation. Um, we're almost out of time here, but we'll be around afterwards if anybody would like to ask any questions. Thank you very much for your time and being here today. Thank you.